I wanted to give you four specific examples that I'm going to cover at the end about how a product called Silk tripled their sales by doing one thing, how an artist named Jeff Koons went from being a nobody to making a whole bunch of money and having a lot of impact, to how Frank Gehry redefined what it meant to be an architect, and um, one of my biggest failures as a marketer in the last few years, a, a, a record label I started that had a CD called Sauce. But before I can do that, I got to tell you about sliced bread and a guy named Otto Rowetter. Now, before sliced bread was invented in the 1910s, I wonder what they said, like the greatest invention since the telegraph or something. But this guy named Otto Rowetter invented sliced bread. And he focused, like most inventors did, on the patent part and the making part. And the thing about the invention of sliced bread is this that for the first 15 years after sliced bread was available, no one bought it, no one knew about it. It was a complete and total failure. And the reason is that until Wonder came along and figured out how to spread the idea of sliced bread, no one wanted it. That the success of sliced bread, like the success of almost everything we've been talking about at this conference, is not always about what the patent is like or what the factory is like. It's about can you get your idea to spread or not. And I think that the way you're going to get what you want or cause the change that you want to change to happen is you're going to figure out a way to get your ideas to spread. And it doesn't matter to me whether you're running a coffee shop or you're an intellectual or you're in business or flying hot air balloons. I think that all this stuff applies to everybody regardless of what we do that what we are living in is a century of idea diffusion. That people who can spread ideas, regardless of what those ideas are, win. And when I talk about it, I usually pick business because they make the best pictures that you can put in your presentation and because it's the easiest sort of way to keep score. But I want you to forgive me when I use these examples because I'm talking about anything that you decide to spend your time to do. At the heart of spreading ideas is TV and stuff like TV. TV and mass media made it really easy to spread ideas in a certain way. I call it the TV industrial complex. And the way the TV industrial complex works is you buy some ads, interrupt some people, that gets you distribution. You use the distribution you get to sell more products. You take the profit from that to buy more ads. And it goes around and around and around, the same way the military industrial complex worked a long time ago. That that model of, and we heard it yesterday, if we could only get on the home page of Google, if we could only figure out how to get promoted there, if we could only figure out how to grab that person by the throat and tell them about what we want to do, if we could do that, then everyone would pay attention, we would win. Well, this TV industrial complex informed my entire childhood and probably yours. I mean, all of these products succeeded because someone figured out how to touch people in a way that they weren't expecting, in a way they didn't necessarily want, with an ad over and over and over again until they bought it. And the thing that's happened is they canceled the TV industrial complex. That just over the last few years, what anybody who markets anything has discovered is it's not working the way that it used to. This picture is really fuzzy. I apologize. I had a bad cold when I took it. But, uh, <laughs> The product in the blue box in the center is my poster child. Right? I go to the deli, I'm sick, I need to buy some medicine. The brand manager for that blue product spent $100 million trying to interrupt me in one year. $100 million interrupting me with TV commercials and magazine ads and spam and coupons and shelving allowances and spiffs. Also, I could ignore every single message. And I ignored every message because I don't have a pain reliever problem. I buy the stuff in the yellow box I always have. And I'm not going to invest a minute of my time to solve her problem, because I don't care. Here's a magazine called Hydrate. It's 180 pages about water, right? <laughs> Articles about water, ads about water. Imagine what the world was like 40 years ago when it was the Saturday Evening Post and Time and Newsweek. Now there are magazines about water, new products from Coke Japan, water salad. Okay. Coke Japan comes out with a new product every three weeks because they have no idea what's going to work and what's not. This, I couldn't have written this better myself. It came out four days ago. I circled the important parts so you can see them here. They've come out. Arby's is going to spend $85 million promoting an oven mitt with the voice of Tom Arnold hoping 
that that will get people to go to Arby's and buy a roast beef sandwich. Now, I want you to try to imagine what could possibly be in an animated TV commercial featuring Tom Arnold that would get you to get in your car, drive across town, and buy a roast beef sandwich. You know, this is Copernicus, and he was right when he's talking to anyone who needs to hear your idea. The world revolves around me. Me, 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 my favorite person, me. I don't want to get email from anybody. I want to get me mail. So consumers, and I don't just mean people who buy stuff at the Safeway. I mean people at the Defense Department who might buy something or people at you know, the New Yorker who might print your article. Consumers don't care about you at all. They just don't care. Part of the reason is they got way more choices than they used to and way less time. And in a world where we have too many choices and too little time, the obvious thing to do is just ignore stuff. And my parable here is you're driving down the road, and you see a cow, and you keep driving. Because you've seen cows before. Cows are invisible. Cows are boring. Who's going to stop and pull over and say, oh, look, a cow? Nobody. <laughs> but if the cow was purple, isn't that a great special effect? I could do that again if you wanted. If the cow was purple, you'd notice it for a while. I mean, if all cows are purple, then you get bored with those too. The thing that's going to decide what gets talked about, what gets done, what gets changed, what gets purchased, what gets built, is, is it remarkable? And remarkable is a really cool word, because we think it just means neat. But it also means worth making a remark about. And that is the essence of where idea diffusion is going. That two of the hottest cars in the United States is a $55,000 giant car big enough to hold a Mini in its trunk. People are paying full price for both, and the only thing they have in common is that they don't have anything in common. <laughs> Every week, the number one best-selling DVD in America changes. It's never The Godfather, it's never Citizen Kane, it's always some third-rate movie with some second-rate star. But the reason it's number one is because that's the week it came out because it's new, because it's fresh, because people saw it and said, I didn't know that was there, and they noticed it. Two of the big success stories the last 20 years in retail. One sells things that are super expensive in a blue box, and one sells things that are as cheap as they can make them. The only thing they have in common is that they're different. We're now in the fashion business. No matter what we do for a living, we're in the fashion business. And the thing is, people in the fashion business know what it's like to be in the fashion business. They're used to it. The rest of us have to figure out how to think that way, how to understand that it's not about interrupting people with big full-page ads or insisting on meetings with people, but it's a totally different sort of process that determines which ideas spread and which ones don't. This chair, they sold a billion dollars worth of Aeron chairs by reinventing what it meant to sell a chair. They turned a chair from something the purchasing department bought to something that was a status symbol about where you sat at work. This guy, Lionel Poulain, the most famous baker in the world, he died two and a half months ago, and he was a hero of mine and a dear friend. He lived in Paris. Last year, he sold $10 million worth of French bread, every loaf baked in a bakery he owned by one baker at a time in a wood-fired oven. And when Lionel started his bakery, the French poo-pooed it. They didn't want to buy his bread. It didn't look like French bread. It wasn't what they expected. It was neat, it was remarkable, and slowly it spread from one person to another person until finally it became the official bread of three-star restaurants in Paris. Now he's in London and he ships by FedEx all around the world. What marketers used to do is make average products for average people. That's what mass marketing is. Smooth out the edges. Go for the center. That's the big market. They would ignore the geeks and, God forbid, the laggards. It was all about going for the center. But in a world where the TV industrial complex is broken, I don't think that's the strategy we want to use anymore. I think the strategy we want to use is to not market to these people, because they're really good at ignoring you, but market to these people, because they care. These are the people who are obsessed with something. And when you talk to them, they'll listen, because they like listening. It's about them. And if you're lucky, 
They'll tell their friends on the rest of the curve, and it'll spread. It'll spread through the entire curve. They have something I call otaku. It's a great Japanese word. It describes the desire of someone who's obsessed to say drive across Tokyo to try a new ramen noodle place, because that's what they do. They get obsessed with it. To make a product, to market an idea, to come up with any problem you want to solve that doesn't have a constituency with an otaku is almost impossible. Instead, you have to find a group that really desperately cares about what it is you have to say. Talk to them and make it easy for them to tell your friends. There's a hot sauce otaku, but there's no mustard otaku. That's why there's lots and lots and lots of kinds of hot sauces and not so many kinds of mustard. Not because it's hard to make interesting mustard. You can make interesting mustard. But people don't because no one's obsessed with it, and thus no one tells their friends. Krispy Kreme has figured this whole thing out. Krispy Kreme has a strategy. And what they do is they enter a city, they talk to the people with the otaku, and then they spread through the city to the people who just cross the street. This yo-yo right here costs $112, but it sleeps for 12 minutes. Not everybody wants it, but they don't care. They want to talk to the people who do, and maybe it'll spread. These guys make the loudest car stereo in the world. <laughs> it's as loud as a 747 jet. You can't get in. The car's got bulletproof glass on the windows because they'll blow out the windshield otherwise. But the fact remains that when someone wants to put a couple speakers in their car, if they've got the otaku or they've heard from someone who does, they go ahead and they pick this. It's really simple. You sell the people who are listening, and maybe, just maybe, those people tell their friends. So when Steve Jobs talks to 50,000 people at his keynote, right, who are all tuned in from 130 countries watching his two-hour commercial, that's the only thing keeping his company in business, is that those 50,000 people care desperately enough to watch a two-hour commercial and then tell their friends. Pearl Jam, 96 albums released in the last two years. Everyone made a profit. How? They only sell them on their website. Those people who buy them on their website have the otaku, and then they tell their friends, and it spreads, and it spreads. This hospital crib costs $10,000, 10 times the standard. But hospitals are buying it faster than any other model. Hard candy nail polish doesn't appeal to everybody, but to the people who love it, they talk about it like crazy. This paint can right here saved the Dutch Boy Paint Company, making them a fortune, cost 35% more than regular paint, because Dutch Boy made a can that people talk about, because it's remarkable. They didn't just slap a new ad on the product, they changed what it meant to build a paint product. Amihotornot.com. Every day, 250,000 people go to this site, run by two volunteers, and I can tell you they're hard graders. And <laughs> they didn't get this way by advertising a lot. They got this way by being remarkable, sometimes a little too remarkable. And this picture frame, has a cord going out the back, and you plug it into the wall. My father has this on his desk, and he sees his grandchildren every day, changing constantly. And every single person who walks into his office hears the whole story of how this thing ended up on his desk. And one person at a time, the idea spreads. These are not diamonds. Not really. They're made from cremains. After you get cremated, you can have yourself made into a gem. Oh, you like my ring? It's my grandmother. Fastest growing business in the whole mortuary industry. But you don't have to be Ozzy Osbourne. You don't have to be super outrageous to do this. What you have to do is figure out what people really want and give it to them. A couple quick rules to wrap up. The first one is design is free when you get to scale. And the people who come up with stuff that's remarkable more often than not figure out how to put design to work for them. Number two, the riskiest thing you can do now is be safe. Procter & Gamble knows this. Right? The whole model of being Procter & Gamble is always about average products for average people. That's risky. The safe thing to do now is to be at the fringes, be remarkable. And being very good is one of the worst things you can possibly do. Very good is boring. Very good is average. It doesn't matter whether you're making a record album or you're an architect or you have a tract on sociology. If it's very good, it's not going to work because no one's going to notice it. So my three stories. Silk. Put a product that does not need to be in the refrigerated section next to the milk in the refrigerated section. Sales tripled. Why? Milk, 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 not milk. Okay. For the people who were there and looking at that section, it was remarkable. They didn't triple their sales with advertising. They tripled it by doing something remarkable. 
That is a remarkable piece of art. You don't have to like it, but a 40-foot tall dog made out of bushes in the middle of New York City <laughs> is remarkable. <laughs> Frank Gehry didn't just change a museum, he changed an entire city's economy by designing one building that people from all over the world went to see. Now, at countless meetings at you know, the Portland City Council or who knows where, they say, we need an architect. Can we get Frank Geary? Right? Because he did something that was at the fringes. And my big failure, I came out with an entire, sorry, a record album, and hopefully a whole bunch of record albums in SACD format, this remarkable new format. And I marketed it straight to people with $20,000 stereos. People with $20,000 stereos don't like new music. So what you need to do is figure out who does care. Who is going to raise their hand and say, I want to hear what you're doing next and sell something to them. The last example I want to give you, this is a map of Soap Lake, Washington. As you can see, if that's nowhere, it's in the middle of it. <laughs> but they do have a lake. And people used to come from miles around to swim in the lake. They don't anymore. So the founding fathers at Soap Lake said, we got some money to spend. What can we build here? And like most committees, they were going to build something pretty safe. And then an artist came to them. This is a true artist's rendering. He wants to build a 55-foot tall lava lamp in the center of town. That's a purple cow. That's something worth noticing. I don't know about you, but if they build it, that's where I'm going to go. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it.